Welcome everybody to another episode of the Life Itself podcast. It's my real joy and privilege today to be joined by Jeff Mulgan. So Jeff is a professor of collective intelligence, public policy and social innovation at University College London. He's also the former chief executive of Nesta and within UK government has acted both as director of the Prime Minister Strategy Unit and head of policy at Downing Street. He's also founded and co-founded a large number of organisations from the think tank Demos to the charity Action for Happiness. And his latest book, which we'll be talking about today, Another World is Possible, How to Reignite Social and Political Imagination, has just been released. So welcome, Jeff. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Now, the book, as, as we touched on, has just been released and this strapline of reigniting social and political imagination. Now, could you briefly outline kind of what you mean by that and what's led you to this as, as a focus area of your work? Well, I've spent a life, I guess, in different ways trying to be involved in change from, from either from the top down within governments or the bottom up in terms of charities and community uh, projects. And I've become more and more convinced in the last few years that we have a bit of a deficit of social and political imagination. We find it quite easy to imagine disasters of all kinds, ecological catastrophes, climate crises, especially perhaps in a, a, a summer like this. And there are very strong images of technological futures all around us, of rampant robots or AI, uh, 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 smart cities, smart homes. But I started asking people, um, very well-educated people, activists of all kinds, what was their picture of a welfare state or a health system or a city or democracy a generation or two into the future? And I became more and more struck how few found they could articulate uh, that. You can see an extreme example of this in the uh, current leadership campaign to be Prime Minister of Britain, leader of the Conservative Party, where literally none of the candidates seem to have any ideas at all that somehow cutting taxes will bring us to the, the promised land. And things aren't much better uh, in the, their main opposition, the Labour Party. And a bit the same is true in other parties. So I think we have a, we have a problem that we're missing this, this view of the path ahead of how things could be better, what our options are. And that led me in the book to try and explore the history and how in the past have people tried to imagine with varying degrees of success that made me want to look at the methods of how could you organize imagination more systematically and how might those fit together into broader political imaginaries. And I guess what I'm asking of any reader is hopefully to agree with me both on the diagnosis and they can disagree. <laughs> they can, you know, is there a problem of imagination? Is, has something gone a bit wrong? And if you do accept that, what might be the uh, solution to it? Mm, absolutely. I mean, I think it's it's really pertinent that you're you're touching on the abject lack of ideas in the current British yeah. political system for, for a fellow bit myself. And one of the interesting things that I noticed was once you sort of bring in the frame of imagination and particularly the deficit thereof, it seems obvious, but it's something that we kind of hasn't really been raised so much as an issue prior to, to your work around it. And I think one of the analogies I really liked at the start of the book was that we're trapped almost in this equivalent of the Dunning-Kruger Dunning effect around imagination, that, you know, we're so avoid of our devoid of imagination, we can't really see that we're lacking it. And, you know, so I guess the question now I have to you is, how do you think we've got here why is our capacity to imagine seems to have withered away so drastically in the face of real huge progress in other areas, including kind of our raw knowledge about the world? I'm not sure, and I hope I can fuel a debate about explaining that. Um, and I became more and more convinced there was this, this Dunning-Kruger effect in play. And probably the closer you get to the centre of power and the centre of the media, the more stark it is. So most journalists will be completely unaware. They won't even notice this disappearance of imagination or the mainstream politicians. It doesn't even occur to them because it is their, their normal environment. They just accept that's the way things have always been. But what's very striking is that if you went back 50, 60 years, the main parties even in Britain, the Conservatives and Labour Party, had big teams in their head offices working on policy, working on long-term futures. Uh, that's what fueled Margaret Thatcher's programme uh, in the 80s. It fueled many of the policies Labour introduced. And you, it's only when you, you see that that you realise it's unusual that now they have no staff. They literally have no one working on this sort of task. 
So part of my explanation of what might have happened is we've simply stopped feeding the imagination, the institutions which might at one time thought this was part of their role, and they include political parties, they include universities, uh, big single issue movements at various points have had a very strong sense of imagination, and some still do, but overall, we've stopped fueling it, we've stopped feeding it, we've stopped investing in it in the way that we do actually feed, invest in um, technological imagination. And I see this very clearly in a university like uh, University College London, where I am now. If you're working in life sciences or computer science or fields like that, it's kind of assumed you will work on speculative ideas for the future, you know, new inventions, new technologies which could transform the world. And it's, it's also assumed most of them won't work, but a few of them will, and they'll be transformative. And you get funded by research councils and at a certain point by investors and venture capital. But on the social side, there's always nothing equivalent. If you're working in the social sciences, it's, it's, it's actually was career threatening to work on the design of, you know, what might a parliament of 2060 look like? No one can do that. Uh, instead, you have to stick to analysis of the present and the past. Uh, and in some ways, that's healthy trends which try to attend to data and facts which have got us there. But it's killed this capacity to imagine creatively, boldly with um, ambition. And that in turn has fed through to our politics. And as you say, British politics is a pretty bad example, but in some ways the US is even worse with these two, the last presidential election fought between two very elderly men. And it may well be the next one will be fought by the same elderly men uh, with politics being taken backwards by an elderly Supreme Court. You know, in, in both countries, the political systems, the heart of them is so far behind the best of their societies that it's, it's, it's almost a, a, a tragic situation we've reached with this, say, not just squeezing imagination, but a sort of nostalgic, backward looking uh, political class. Mm, absolutely. And I mean, I think it's a really valid point to touch on perhaps what we might call the, the internal selection effects of, of our institutions and, and what might get you ahead, as you say, in the contrast of the, the tech sphere versus the, the political and social scientific sphere. I mean, it reminds me a little of the, the explore exploit trade off that you hear mentioned in, in computer science. And I think you actually touched on in your book of kind of how we optimize between exploring new things and new ideas and then exploiting kind of our knowledge of what we have to kind of, you know, optimize our utility or anything else. And I wonder if there's there's been a sense, particularly in the social sciences, that we've had this big institutional step change into modernity of kind of neoliberal institutional structures and things like that and such. We almost have these internal effects of people in these institutions that the way that you optimize your own utility and your career progression and everything else is exploiting what's already there and kind of deepening and, and specializing and all of the rest of it, rather than kind of looking out and, and being at the, the very forefront of what could be. Yeah, I, I think there, I mean, within the universities, there are many, many factors. Um, I'm not sure how much of it is, is neoliberalism, because I think you get the same in university systems, which are almost wholly untouched by it and are much more traditionally hierarchical, uh, like in much, of, um, in much of Europe. In a way, they're even less favourable to radical imagination than the British and American university systems. But it's, there's no doubt it has had exactly the effect you described. In any society, any group, you need this balance between the explorers and the exploiters. And you need the explorers to give you new options. If you're a small you know, band or tribe in prehistory, you needed some people to go out and see where there might be new, you know, new hunting grounds or new foods to try out, even if most people are stuck with exploiting what you already had. And in a way, that's the heart of, I guess, my concern is we're not generating enough options. And that's the heart of, you know, since the social function of imagination is to explore. So there's alternative things we could do that there are worked through ways of running a very low carbon economy or preparing for pandemics or, you know, dealing with the challenges of a, a rapidly aging society. If you don't have those options, you're likely to fail in response to a change in the environment or a change in, in conditions. And that's been, that's a sort of always an evolutionary uh, uh, a fact. And my fear is we're just strikingly lacking in options at the moment. And this will become, I think, more and more apparent as the crises we are in deepen. 
And in the short run, I'm quite pessimistic. I think we could see you know, a, a further layering up of crises. We haven't really recovered from the financial crash 15 years ago. Ever since then, incomes have been stagnant for much of certainly the North, the Western world. That fueled the political crisis, which gave us Trump and Brexit and Salvini and Marine Le Pen and lots of others. We've then had obviously COVID, we've got the climate crisis intensifying alongside that. And we now we have a, an energy crisis a, leading to a food crisis, which will in turn lead to probably more political crises. I was just uh, yeah last night seeing the incredible pictures from Sri Lanka of you know a whole population was rising up to overthrow a political uh, leadership. And at that point, you need options. You need things which you can do as a society. And they may be options which seem completely impossible two or five years ago. But if in a crisis, suddenly they become possible again. And my, my concern is we're not generating enough of these options, enough well thought through ones, uh, enough which have been properly debated and understood by the society at every level. And instead, we default to these kind of soundbite crudities make America great again, or going back to the Conservative Party leadership, the idea that if only you cut taxes, you know, you sort of solve the world's problems, which literally no one believes, but it's kind of uh, enough to get them by. But that's not an option. That's not the kind of option we need uh, to actually thrive in the next few decades. Mm, absolutely. And I mean, I think it's it's telling that the, the term polycrisis is one that's sort of becoming somewhat of a term de jour in the the, the social change spheres that, that you and I perhaps, are, perhaps mix in. And if that's that that's the case, that our crises are in fact deeply interlocked and in this way that you, you touched on there, that we do need an entirely new new playbook for, for how to address them. And, and that requires, as you say, imagination of the kind that we don't currently have. Now, you, you touched on in the book, there's kind of almost two steps to, to forward looking imagination of the, of the kind that we say the daily needs, kind of detaching from almost the, the reification of our present circumstances and, and realizing that things don't have to be this way. And then extending our minds to possible alternatives. Now, actually, you, as, you, as you kind of rightly outlined, people have been doing this in various ways for quite some time, be that the kind of sketching of utopian visions, kind of the, the creation of generative ideas like human rights and lifestyles like veganism and, you know, even through alternative organisational models and kind of what you've called neotopias, the people that have actually gone out and then built alternative forms of, of society and civilization. Now, talk us through a little around maybe what we can learn from these different experiments in imagining and how we might draw on them going forward. Well, it's a wonderfully rich history and I enjoyed looking into them all, as you say, from um, fiction, from, the, the, from fictional utopias through to new towns, community communes, uh, great exhibitions which showed people different uh, options for the future. And as you say, they have these kind of twin roles. One is to liberate us, to free us from believing the social world is fixed, is mutable, and realizing actually it's much more plastic uh, than that, and then helping us to design alternatives. And different forms have different virtues. So take utopias. Um, I was really struck reading some of the feminist utopias, which go back now 700 years, far further back than I thought, uh, to the early 15th century, the 17th, 18th, 19th century, lots of different kind of feminist utopias clearly played a role in liberating people from the assumption that patriarchy was a fact of, of nature. Uh, some of them were quite a bit crazy. <laughs> some of them were very creative, but they didn't really tell you what to do. They didn't give you a playbook for um, rebuilding your laws or the vote or, or the workplace. And that came later. And in a way, it was then only in the 19th century, in the 20th century, that much more detailed work went into what had to be done in terms of equality laws, norms in the workplace, uh, education, uh, then all the way through to rethinking things like health services through a gender lens. Uh, and even right now, one of the things um, I've been working a bit on through the pandemic is, you know, gender focused recovery plans post COVID, which are quite different from seeing those without a gender lens. But it takes quite a lot of time uh, uh, to build up this sort of thickness, as I call it, this richness of social imagination, where the was the generative ideas and the liberation from fixedness is then added onto with lots of social experience, essentially, and, and practical uh, options. So for me, that's what's, that's what's fascinating. 
It's also why the physical places are so intriguing. Uh, I look at examples like New Lanarkshire in the early 19th century, where Robert Owen, who was writing about cooperation, also created factories and schools to embody his idea of cooperation. At the same time, he tried creating communes in America, uh, which were a complete disaster, and new harmony. He tried to invent a new religion, which was a complete disaster. So sometimes the failures are as interesting as the uh, as the successes. And in some ways, you know, the, the, the recent experience of eco towns and green towns and experiment with new ways of living without perhaps cars, with entirely renewable energy, with very low waste, are all in that in that spirit. And some of them uh, succeed very well. I just think we need more of that. We need more of both the, the creativity of fiction. We need the best novelists to be imagining not just dark dystopias, which they're very good at doing now, but also more nuanced positive versions. And it's now 50 or 60 years since the last really best-selling utopian novel, which was probably Ursula Le Guin, or maybe Marge Piercy, um, showing sort of anarchist, um, feminist utopias. There's all been essentially almost none since then. Kim Stanley Robinson attempted in his ministry the future a quasi-utopia, but it's not really quite a utopia, but it's an interesting use of fiction to explore climate change. We need all of that, but then also we need its, um, its embodiment in the world in real places, which prefigure, which show you know, the way to a, a different kind of society. And in the end, I think people are only persuaded when in the sense they can see things on multiple levels from the level of ideas to the very practical and see that it actually works. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that speaks a little to, to your differentiation between thick and thin imagination, which I really liked and would like to come to. But are there any projects or works that you've seen in, in the present era that you think are, are really embodying this kind of, you know, either either aspect of, of the kind of imaginative kind of, you know, ideas or, or their their sort of physical implementation um, that you've been really impressed by? Well, I think if you, look, if you look in almost any field, you will find some often in quite surprising places. So schools are a good example all over the world. There are radically different schools based on very different principles. For example, not focused so much on exams and knowledge transfer, much more focused on creating the kind of people we need, uh, which usually means they spend much more of their time on real life projects or working in teams or developing sort of inner character as well as mastery of geography uh, and maths. They're nearly always on the edge of the system, often in conflict with the uh, the main shapes of that system, but these are you know, real places, they're not just uh, theories. Similarly in health, you know, there's lots of fertile creativity on you know, what, what does the health system look like, which really genuinely puts prevention on the same level as cure, or really takes mental health as seriously as physical health. But again, they tend to be on the edges of the systems, not at their core. And I think part of our task in, you know, in the 2020s is, is ensuring we can learn from all of those, that they're connected up, they're in, interrogated, evaluated to help us navigate much larger scale systems change. And the problem is often they sit a little bit below the radar, they're not really noticed, they're not really uh, you know, uh, made sense of. And there probably aren't the, 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 the skilled people trying to draw out of them what is generalizable and what is very, contextual, what it would only make sense in that particular place uh, and time. And yet that's what we need. And in a way, what you know, Robert Owen was doing in New Lanark was saying, here are some very broad general principles. Let's make a, a world built of cooperation, not competition. Here's how it could work in a factory or a school. But then it took lots of other people to apply cooperation to all sorts of other uh, other industries or other fields from housing to shopping to uh, to building cars you know or washing machines and you know 300 million people now work in co-ops around the world so it's, it's become fairly large scale. Mm, absolutely I mean one of, one of my favorite examples which I think you know you touch on in the book and in my former life in alternative consultancy used to wheel out a lot was Burtzorg which for, for our listeners that don't know is kind of the 
incredibly successful Dutch healthcare organization, which took a radically different approach with very flat hierarchy, decentralized teams that would embed into social communities rather than kind of existing as the, these abstracted healthcare providers. And resultantly, as well as having incredibly great sort of patient satisfaction, save the Dutch healthcare system loads of money. And what's fascinating to me, and I, I pose to you is that despite, you know, us perhaps even being vaguely aware of things being done differently and that the benefits that they can pose, we still find we really, really struggle even at the individual level in this kind of two-step process of imagination of not just collapsing into the world being as it is and then kind of in extending beyond and, and really concretely thinking how things can be different beyond vague allusions to, you know, be eliminating poverty or whatever else. Why do you think we find it so hard as, as people? Well, I, I, th I think our brains are very good at reification, to use yeah, Karl Marx's term. You know, we live in a world of physical things, uh, and a remarkable number of our metaphors are actually sort of physical ones. Things go up or they go down or they grow or they shrink or, you know, we go forward or back and so on. And perhaps it's inevitable that we translate in our minds social institutions which are intangible and invisible into assuming they are like the physical stuff of buildings or mountains or you know pieces of furniture like the one I'm sitting on here and therefore it's quite hard with psychologically to see them as impermanent as human made and therefore as uh, as objects of imagination. I, I quote the philosopher John Searle, who I quite liked on this, who's a, he's a, he's a quirky, slightly odd philosopher, but he does point out almost every social institution is essentially a figment of our collective imagination. Money, you know, money is only worth something because we collectively decide it's going to be worth something. You know, laws only work if we believe they're there and actually obey them even if we're not about to be uh, 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 arrested. Or we'll believe in yeah something like a parliament as a kind of or in America the constitution is treated as something was sacred. It's just a piece of paper agreed by a bunch of men, you know, two hundred and fifty years ago. You know, that's that's all it is. So this this capacity to generate shared fictions, then to believe in them, then to act as if they were true, so they do become true, is just part of how every society works. And sometimes that's a conserving force. Sometimes it reinforces what you described, that, you know, default inertia to believing things can only be the way they are. But you only need to tweak it a little bit to realize, of course, if all these things are imagined, they can be reimagined. Uh, and we can, you know, bring in a new constitution or a new law uh, or perhaps a new kind of money, as many people have uh, tried doing. And so long as enough other people are willing to believe in it, it then becomes real. That's, I think, the empowering part of this. Absolutely. And I think that that gradated process that you touched on there maps quite nicely to this distinction between and the kind of transition to a thin imagination, as you conceive of it, and, and thick imagination. So could you expand a little bit more on, on what you mean by, by that distinction? Well, I, I try to say that if we look at the imaginaries, which really had a very big influence on the world, they tended to have these sort of layers added on where there was a sort of, at the core, say something like corporation, a very a simple ethos, corporation's a good thing. Then they'd have a series of almost um, articulations of that, you know, let's run the economy based on cooperation rather than competition. Then over time, it started getting applied in everything from yeah, manufacturing to schooling to to shopping to what have you and then you you build up a whole series of practices and it becomes part of people's jobs and part of accountability and part of norms and then you've got a thick imaginary whereas some remain quite thin I mean one of the ones slightly to my surprise I concluded was in some ways thin was Buddhism uh, which in some ways has an incredibly profound sort of diagnosis of the world and ethos and obviously a set of practices but it it's slightly surprising how little serious Buddhist social thought there is. There's a bit of economic thought like um, Schumacher and so on, but not very much. And it's quite hard to picture a Buddhist political party, which is one sort of test of this. What would its program actually look like? And maybe there's good reasons to, to stop short there, uh, though it makes Buddhism different in that respect from 
uh, Christian social democracy, which tried to create an entire thick imaginary, uh, which in some ways had, had roots in, uh, in Christianity. Anyway, that's one of the things that I'm sort of keen to explore a bit further, this thinness and thickness point. But you only really change the world if you, if you, you, you have all those layers filled in from the really quite abstract uh, to the, the multiply everyday uh, and habitual. Mm, I think that that Buddhism point I found really interesting and it's kind of posed a question to me because I know it's quite an influential and you know many of my colleagues and, and many of the are kind of mutual acquaintances who are deeply influenced by those practices in their approach to social change and I wonder I would imagine the kind of standard Buddhist response is you know I think the the Buddha said when asked around around these kind of questions you know I, I leave that to the scholars of those fields I only, I only mm. speak of suffering and quite quite deliberately stepped back almost as as a point of of his spiritual spiritual teaching um and i would imagine there would be that kind of buddhist resistance of we don't want to wade into this for risk of um losing kind of what is the what is at the core of our teaching but at the same time as you say if you want wholesale social transformation you kind of need all of these different components so how does one construct a you know, move from, from thin imagination to the thick imagination we might need for impact. And I think crucially, how might we draw on these traditions which might have something to say at the, the higher levels of imagination, but which perhaps we may want to keep insulated almost from these kind of the muddier, messier and more complex aspects of how we organise our society at a granular level. Well, I quite like the muddy, messy stuff. So I, I, I'm, mm. I'm a bit nervous of anyone who wants to be too insulated from it. Um, and maybe give a, 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 another example, which I talk a bit about in the book, which is the circular economy or the idea of moving to a you know, radically lower waste, radically low carbon way of living. Um, now, as a sort of concept that probably first took shape in the 60s 70s and 80s I think the idea was literally that phrase circular economy is probably an one from the 80s I found myself first working on projects in that space in, in the 90s so nearly 30 years ago but it was still probably fairly thin then it was a kind of you know a very simple idea let's have an economy which doesn't just waste enormous amount of resources and which reuses its glass its plastic its metals and so on in a circular way because otherwise the world will run out so that's a very simple generative idea but it then took a huge amount of detailed work to turn that into new laws uh, so one of my little party tricks is i sometimes ask people you know what percentage of paper now in europe is recycled and I find even highly educated audiences, including professors at universities, get this completely wrong. Uh, uh, the, the answer in Europe is about 74%. Huge amount. In, within a generation, a total transformation of the circularity of bits of the economy. Um, I then, if I mean, ask them what percentage of clothing is recycled. Um, and the, the correct answer is about 2%. So, you know, in other fields, we've got, we've, we've hard at the starting point and all the trends have been going in, in the wrong way. But the point is, it's a lot of detailed, practical work to shift to reuse of plastics and paper and glass and metals and so on. And we're reasonably advanced in some fields and not at all uh, in others. The moral of the story though, is I don't think that articulation of making the circularity practical. I don't think that in any ways detracts from, in some ways, the quite almost deep origins of the overall idea, which is to you know, walk lightly on the earth, not to be to be in balance with your 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 environment, to leave a legacy to future generations which you haven't uh, run down. To me, the practical, messy, muddy stuff actually strengthens the original starting idea, it's, it's ethic, it's an ethos, rather than, than being against it. Uh, and that's why I was, I guess, I try and encourage people who think in these very lofty ways to try and connect that to the everyday, the, the rhythms of daily life. That's in some ways where maybe I think ultimately you should find God <laughs> in, in the everyday. Absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And I think that's, you know, as, as quite a, a practical action focused person myself reconciling that with you know growing awareness of spirituality etc has been a, an ongoing inquiry should we say i mean I, I suppose one of the the interesting points there so you touch on the idea of the circular economy 
And as you say, there's a lot there philosophically, which does deeply overlap with various forms of call it spirituality, you know, be it reverence for the the, the living and also, you know, the material world full stop, be it, as you say, treading lightly, balance. These are all themes that show up in, in Buddhism, in Taoism, which, whichever um, tradition you may want to pick on. But um, that speaks a little to me of the, you say in the book around like successful imaginaries almost being Mongols and needing to combine aspects from, from different traditions, different fields, and use that to construct this overall thick, thick imaginary. Um, and that seems like a really good example there. And I suppose what I mean is maybe this doesn't, you know, the circular economy doesn't have to be Buddhist politics in action. We can have kind of our, our aspect of Buddhism, but then say, you know, actually this is deeply aligned with and fits very nicely in as an, another puzzle piece, but is a, is a coherent program without putting it all under the auspices of this one sort of tradition or umbrella. Yeah, I, th I think I completely agree with what you just said there. Something like a circular economy depends on, lots of types of knowledge. It requires you know, engineering knowledge, scientific knowledge, technological knowledge, psychological knowledge of how people will you know, behave in their kitchen uh, and things like that. And you can't deduce all of those from, um, from Buddhism or any philosophical principles. They're not in the sort of logical, neat construct. They are much more like assemblies or mongrels or, or hybrids and most really successful, I think, Pro political programs or institutions or social change have this multiple sides to them then and, and if they're too simple and linear and logical they they become pathological uh, 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 as well that's not the way the world is the world is sort of nicely messy and uh, and complex and we should welcome that rather than seeing that as a problem the world is far more complex than our brains can grasp and therefore anything which we completely grasp with our brains risks being a, a simplification. If we pursue it too single-mindedly, we will do damage to the world. So I think an essence of humility is realizing our smallness and our lack of capacity really to grasp the world we're in. Uh, and that should then be an argument for a bit of bricolage and the things we pull together mm. to, act, to act in the world. Absolutely. And I mean, from your, your research and, and study of, of those imaginaries and examples of bricolage that have been successful, have you drawn out any lessons which you think might be, be generalizable for you know, fitting together different pieces and, and engaging in this imaginative construction? Well, I mean, a, a very big shift of perspective, perhaps for the 21st century compared to the 20th, is, uh, and is I think a lot of <laughs> the world learnt the risk of blueprints essentially of trying to do an imaginary representation of a perfect utopia or endpoint and then trying to impose it on a real existing society. I mean, that was, I'm slightly caricaturing what Marxism, Marxism, Leninism did to a third of the world, but only slightly. And the alternative view is, you know, whatever idea you have, try it out first learn from experience rather than imposing a paper representation on society and do so in ways which involve the people who will live with the idea so they have some say over whether it continues or stops and these two very simple principles experiment and uh, and empower i think protects one from the dark side of imagination uh, which can run rampant and can do huge damage uh, in, in the wrong hands or the wrong ideology or the wrong uh, system. So that's in a way that the exploratory spirit, for me, is explore and exploit, but it's explore in a way which is exploratory, which is willing to constantly learn. Now, there are, there are limits to that because it's hard to transform whole systems in that way where lots of things do connect with lots of other things. But I still don't really see what the alternative is um, if we're trying to yeah, transform our welfare, our politics, our, 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 our ecology. Another example of a space where I think we need much more imagination is uh, on, on age. You know, we are moving into a, you know, a society with a dramatically older average age than 50, 60 years ago. You know, life expectancy seems to have stalled in the UK, but overall it probably is worldwide carrying on upwards to 90, 100, perhaps perhaps more, 
That will require us to change almost all of our, our institutions, uh, take a very different approach to care, to disability, because there'll be many more people around us with some quite serious disability, and also changing our views of death. You know, we uh, many societies have tried to almost ignore death or hide it away, but coming to terms with what is a good death as a bad death is one of the things which we will have to attend to uh, in this era. And this is, again, I think a place, going back to what you were saying earlier, where there was a, a, a spiritual perspective on things overlaps with quite practical stuff about how do we organize everyday care. So one little statistic I tried out on a bunch of school kids last week, actually, which I quite like is, I asked them, cold symptoms, are they more likely amongst old people who socialize a lot or who don't socialize a lot? Now, an audience of school kids and an audience of university professors all say, well, of course, you're going to get more cold symptoms amongst the old people who socialize a lot. Um, and it turns out that's the opposite of the truth. The correct answer is cold symptoms are more likely amongst the, uh, the, um, the isolated than amongst the sociable because isolation is so bad for our both physical and mental health, the equivalent to perhaps smoking 40 cigarettes a day, according to some estimates. Now, a little fact like that almost transforms how you think about what is good care for the elderly. It means you've got to not just create safe little boxes or rooms for them to be looked after in, but you want to maximize sociability, activity, friendship, dancing, all these other things. That's a uh, and that's a very different approach to elder care that perhaps has dominated policy making for the last 50, 100 years. Mm. And I think age, age and, and mortality is a great example, because I think it also really touches on, which is, again, a, a themes in your, your book when you talk about the arts and performance and things like that, the deep connection between feeling and effective imagination. And that actually our ability to imagine into how we might reconceive of these things requires almost quite a, a deep emotional confrontation with our, our baked in sort of cultural norms and, and deeply rooted fears around, you know, death, mortality, sort of impending decrepitude, which is likely going to greet us all. And, you know, these are all very scary things and things that we've been culturally conditioned not to engage with. And actually going through that deeply emotive process of confronting them is almost the, the necessary first step to getting into all of this areas of, of policy and you know other forms of institutional design which are traditionally treated as devoid of emotion. Exactly and I think that imagination is about feelings as much as it is about reason and you can't although I'm talking about a book in a way you can't enter it by reading a book uh, often it is theatre, simulations, role plays, embodiments of different kinds, uh, often make it much easier to grasp a different possible landscape or world than just cognition. Um, now, this is quite hard for those of us brought up on reading and writing books or based in institutions like universities, which are so text based. But I think it is, in some ways, this is obvious perhaps to most people that often your feelings of a different kind of society may be most intense at some kind of cultural event, a music festival or dancing, or perhaps a protest, you know, taking over the bridges of a the city. Then it suddenly crystallizes another kind of world which could be possible in ways you could never quite get just from, uh, from words. Mm, yeah, and I think, you know, that really chimes with at least my understanding of the, the more cutting edges of cognitive science, you know, the Varelas, who I think we're, we're both great, great fans of, the, the Andy Clarks, who talk about embodied cognition and how our, our cognitive processes are so deeply bound up in, in how we feel in our bodies and how, how we, we engage perhaps emotionally as well. Um, and I think what's incredibly fascinating there is that our society and what's kind of optimized for, as, as you touch on in kind of our education systems and, and elsewhere, is completely away from that. And we've almost drifted back into a, a technocratic form of high modernism where we think we can have abstracted analytic approaches to, to social ills without engaging at that level. Um, and I wonder kind of one of the really interesting aspects of, of the book and we can perhaps now move to was what we do about all of this and what the kind of practical action guidance is. 
Um, and I wonder what your, your initial prescriptions maybe at the personal level to start, and then we can move on to institutionally might be. Well, in, in a way, I wanted the book to offer a kind of uh, quite a wide menu of different things you could do rather than being too prescriptive. <laughs> it's not me telling anyone what they should, should or shouldn't do. And I guess I'm trying to encourage anyone at the very personal level, at least to cultivate uh, a, a, a picture of the way ahead. And in a sense, you need that every level. You need for your own well-being, you need some sense of where you might be in five, 10, 20, 30 years time. If you've got children, you probably want at least you know, some very fuzzy notion of where you'd like them to be. But to try and have the same for your, your community, your street, your town, your nation, your world, that seems to be a useful exercise to do, ideally with others. But probably more of my prescription is aimed at, at institutions which have the power to help us with imagination, but aren't doing so enough right now. And those range from places like universities, where I argue for creating you know, centers and programs which are exploring things like what should be our care for the elderly in Manchester or Marseille or you know, Munich in, in 40 years time. Um, through to political parties and mayors and elected politicians, the best of whom at some points have commissioned very large scale exercises of collective thinking ahead. And I, I write about some of those, but very few do that now. None of the mayors in the UK have done that in living, uh, in living memory. Um, philanthropy has a role to play. It's got the free money. Uh, and of course, philanthropy often comes out of you know, past inequality and uh, uh, the, some of the worst excesses of capitalism so often finds this difficult. But uh, I would love to see philanthropy being a little bit more imaginative. And there are interesting examples like uh, the, the, the Lottery Fund in the UK ran a two year program, what they called Emerging Futures, supporting about 50 communities in collective imagination projects, which was, I, I thought, you know, really interesting, creative thing to do fairly small scale but showed it can be uh, can be done and it's and and I would like every school to be getting school kids having taking part in exercises which are tapping into their creativity to think of what kind of world they want to live in how could they shape it in a sense it just becomes habitual in a way that I guess all, all I'm encouraging a bit like art you know a, a good society is one where everyone feels reasonably competent drawing a drawing taking a photograph making some music why not also have everyone reasonably competent in a bit of social imagination too? Uh, and probably the stakes are a bit higher <laughs> than with the other kinds of imagination uh, and we can all benefit. And I don't think it's that emotion and feeling are, uh, are, are sort of squeezed out by a soulless technocracy. It's just that they're, they're legitimated and encouraged in domains other than the ones which are about our collective future. So it's okay to do that on your Instagram feed or on social media, or you, know, you go to see a Marvel movie, which is fine, it does no harm, but where we most need it is in our collective sense of agency and shaping and ownership of, of the future. And that's, that's where it's mm. missing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a, a useful kind of bit of nuance to, to add to my very broad brushstrokes picture there. Um, because yeah, I think you're, you're absolutely right that the issue is, is less that it's completely snuffed out, but that we're in a society of, of hyper specialization, not only of skills, but also of, of ways of thinking and engaging with the world. You know, I mean, I look back to my own education, I was an academically smart kid. And so all of a sudden I was funneled off into, you know, the social sciences, did my sciences, all the rest of it. And I left the creative stuff in the dust because it wasn't relevant to me and I was performing very well without it. And then, you know, speaking to, to your idea of the exploratory social sciences, that sounds like a wonderful degree that I definitely would have done and should, should, would it have existed. Um, and I wonder how much that, that return to interdisciplinarity and setting up institutional spaces where that can, can thrive play, plays a role there. I mean, I, I think of, we have great examples of being kind of like the Bloomsbury set or various other kind of equivalent groupings where we have artists learning from, from social scientists, learning from humanitarians and that, inter and cross-pollination being a, a crucial component of allowing us to, to learn how to think in these different ways that are somewhat absent and you know that you touch on with tools that we can borrow from the arts and from creativity and apply in these other contexts. Yeah and, and I guess my, my recommendation would to anyone is, is do have a some field which you really know deeply 
it doesn't matter if it's medicine or uh, communications technology or ancient history or whatever. I think there's a great virtue in some depth, but have it a T structure. So you also have alongside that depth, you have that breadth and can cross pollinate from very different fields and how they, they see the world. And all, all the, the creative exploration has to tap into something from the arts, from science, from social science in an integrative way. And as you say, some of the most dynamic places and movements of the past were precisely good because they did connect people across radically different disciplines who fueled each other's thinking. That seems to be surprisingly hard. We have a, you know, a lot of knowledge organized in very ferocious disciplines, or it's slightly over influenced by a sort of public intellectualism, which is all about just having a few soundbite opinions to offer uh, you know, on a TV show, not actually grounded in any depth in anything at all. Uh, and that actually I don't think is very helpful because it, it almost keeps ideas and commentary a bit detached from the materiality of the world, from doing stuff uh, for, for, for real. And that's why I'm actually a bit skeptical of many public intellectuals who I think operate at a slight level of abstraction, which sometimes can be as misleading as it is helpful. Mm. I'm in an engineering department at the university now, so I'm probably a bit biased in that respect. <laughs> but I like I like things where, you, like the virtue of engineering, is you build a bridge, either it stands up or it falls. You can't bullshit on that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, with standing and kicking the tires, I think should be quite a, a good litmus test. And I, I agree, it seems to have been lost a little in, in some areas. Um, and you've touched on a little there that you know this is difficult, and there's likely to be to be some resistance and quite a lot of institutional inertia around the, the shifts that you, you talk about in, in the book to, to foster imagination. Now, you know, we can hope that lots more people will, will read your book and can take inspiration. And, you know, I would thoroughly recommend it to all those listening. But beyond that, how might we, or what do you foresee as the kind of initial steps to overcome this, this inertia and, and to start shifting our institutions to afford imagination and overcome that, that first aspect of the Dunning-Kruger effect we started on when people are so unaware that we need it that perhaps you're gonna get quite a lot of resistance. I don't know, and, and uh, I, I'm sure others will have better answers than me. I think crisis will have an effect. I think often we hold on to what's familiar until it no longer <laughs> works. It often takes uh, some crises to dislodge that, that inertia. Uh, and that uh, sort of sluggishness of thought. Um, I hope then into that space, all the institutions I mentioned earlier in a more systematic way will cultivate not just the imagination, but its articulation into real world and, and, and real life um, experiments. I hope we will see a jump in what I call collective intelligence methods, which is the ways we all learn in real time from each other's trials and experiments and uh, an attempt to push back uh, the frontiers. But my real hope is to be surprised and that others will be able to find ways of using some of the things I point to, maybe inspired by the history, maybe seeing the use of some of the methods to do things which I couldn't imagine at all myself in a way. That's what one hopes to offer a ladder which can then be thrown away uh, and not much more than that. Mm, absolutely. Um... That's great. Going, going beyond, beyond the limits of our own imaginations is, I think, a, a great aspiration to have with this work. Um, but I think that that, that point to, to collective intelligence is an interesting one. So, I mean, one of the, the interesting things, and I think it's, it's something that you and I have talked about, is that there actually is quite a lot of interesting and imaginative stuff going on up there if you know where to look. And the, the sphere of Web3 and, and blockchain is, is quite a potentially intriguing example of that. Now, whatever one may think about the, the underlying kind of economic and other principles. And I think, you know, the, the current crisis that's playing out in, in that sphere speaks volumes to, to those in many, many cases. There has been a, almost a Cambrian explosion of experimentation in, in new forms of, of governance, in new forms of, you know, organizing ourselves and doing work together and collaborating. But we haven't actually done much systematic interrogation of how that might apply more broadly. And there's either throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater and discounting it all or kind of saying, you know, this is 
we're going to go deep into to blockchain land and down the, down the rabbit hole with this. And I wonder how much of a piece of the puzzle is that more systematic interrogation and kind of gathering of what's already going on and looking at how we might apply it across contexts. Yeah, so I, I, mean, I think any big new family of technologies like the internet was make it possible to organize things in very very different ways you couldn't have an amazon an uber a wikipedia 30 40 years ago without the internet so it's, it should be blindingly obvious that technologies allow different organizational models you then unfortunately though get this pattern which we've had around blockchain and web 3 where on the one hand, you get evangelists who say it will solve everything and automatically achieves democracy, equality, and everything else. And then you get a bunch of skeptics who often are not very tech savvy and just feel a bit threatened by it. So say it's useless, it doesn't mean anything. Whereas it seems to be obvious the answer will be somewhere in between. But as you say, it has to be thought through a bit systematically. There's a different organizational model needed for you know, your local energy system or waste collection or an investment bank or a prison or a court system or a WHO. You know, we, we live in a world of millions of organizations, most of which are very different from each other and for good reason, because they're trying to do different things. And so the task which has to be done is thinking through reasonably systematically well, what kind of new tools might work for what new task. And my frustration with the Web3 field is it seems to have no, no, no interest in that. It just assumes it's a one size fits all generic solution to everything, which obviously is not going to be the case. And the skeptics are anything even worse because they don't even have the curiosity to think how new tools could be used to make their organizations better, more responsive, uh, more open and smarter. So for me, this is a, a great task for the next few years is thinking this through systematically with both better theory, but also better practice and experiment. Because in a way it's only through experiment we'll find out what works. The successes in the internet were in many ways very different from what was expected 10 or 20 years before. And again, this is because the world is more complicated than our minds. You can't really expect to be able to predict in any detail what will work, what will fly. And to an extent it's only by trying things out that you discover. But that's what I think we need to do with these, this next generation, Web3, blockchain, et cetera, to see if they can actually enhance our lives, solve problems, which we were struggling to solve before. Mm. Now, I can imagine to kind of put my, my devil's advocate hat on for, for a second, that there'll be some people listening to our conversation and kind of, you know, our, our reports of perhaps us coming back with, with deep excitement that we found a new interesting looking governance mechanism that's been present on, on the blockchain, or even that, you know, we've, we've engaged in some imaginative practice and have come up with some radical new ideas for, for how to organize society differently. And we'll kind of respond that that's all well and good from, from a position of, of comfort and of privilege, but actually what's needed right now is addressing the deeply harsh and often quite brutally simple realities of, of the situations we face, be they kind of, you know, in, in the West, sort of rampant inflation and, you know, a cost of living crisis, which actually, you know, so, so says some skeptics, I may imagine, is fairly simple to understand that the, the causes and the, the potential salves to that, or even, you know, global, global supply chains breaking down and, as you say, leaving certain nations without sort of adequate food to put on the table and that's been the case case for some time so to those that say you know let's address the basic stuff first and then start get, getting off with the, the fun and fancy of imagination what, what would you respond well i i'd always put it the other way around i, I work a lot in what's sometimes called the south i don't really like you talking about the global south the global north the world's much more complicated than that um, I'll be spending some of tomorrow on a project in Bangladesh on Thursday with a group of um, UNDP teams from both uh, Africa and, and Asia. And in some ways, I'm struck how in many fields they are able to perhaps jump and imagine and do things with more flexibility than the old countries of Europe and North America, which feel just a bit so stuck in their in their habits. I mean, as an example, I mean, doing a, a project looking at how different countries handle the pandemic and use their intelligence to quickly respond to not just the health side aspects, but the economics aspects, the mental health aspects. And by and large, 
the oldest countries have performed worst in those respects. So it's a complicated picture, but it's everywhere from Taiwan to India to Uruguay. We're seeing really impressive models, which actually Europe should be and North America should be learning from. And of course, they're all now thinking, how can we apply some of that to things like food scarcity uh, and the coming challenges of the next year? So it's definitely true. You have to attend to the, the fundamentals of things like housing, food, uh, before uh, getting on to luxuries of imagination. Um, but if you're faced with a really big problem, like a global pandemic, what's striking is how many different parts of the world reacted, in some cases with both huge imagination and collective uh, mutual effort um, in ways to deal with it. And others, as I say, generally the older, perhaps more, slightly more arrogant, more pompous countries really didn't do very well at all. Mm, yeah, I suppose that's a, the, the pandemic's a great example because while, as you say, of course, these ongoing issues of, of security of basic needs are not going anywhere, in fact, arguably, the, the greatest challenges we might be facing over the, the coming decades and the coming century will be vast shocks, the like of which we, we haven't really seen before, be they the pandemic, be they kind of the increasing ravages of, of the climate crisis or others that we, we're yet to be on the radar. And I suppose those are the ones that, that most need imagination. And in that, in that context, imagination goes from being a luxury to being a, a bare necessity. Yeah, and I think I mean, the crucial thing is also to be willing to learn. I'm very struck that all of us suffer confirmation bias. We want to find data which confirms our views. And weirdly, the cleverer people are, the better they are at only finding data that confirms their views. Let me just give one example which may annoy some people. Uh, Sri Lanka did an extraordinary experiment in the last two or three years in organic farming essentially banning fertilizers in the country. Now it appears that was a total disaster. I mean, a massive disaster, which contributed to the shock Sri Lanka is going through. Now you've essentially got two options. One is you can ignore that because it doesn't fit your worldview, which probably most people do. Or you say, okay, uh, here's some important new information. How do we learn from that? How do we you know, keep the best of what organic farming is trying to do, but not actually ruin lots of people's lives and it's that that habit of hungry self-critical learning seems to me the vital complement of imagination if you only stick with the imagination and don't learn from the experiments then you do risk uh, causing harm to the world and the test of whether you're serious about this is whether you can be self-critical and sometimes challenge your own assumptions and recognize that sometimes the world doesn't quite work the way you expect it to work what, what was it that, that failed in the, the Sri Lankan experiment or what was the mechanism by which organic farming failed? I'm not sure. I want to find more about it. I think the crop yields basically fell sharply uh, and there may be a story about pesticides. There may be a story about fertilizer. I've, I've only seen as it were, the, the, the headlines of it. And it's an example, I think, you know, worth digging into. Um, that's why I mention it, because I, I don't actually know what the lessons are, but clearly something went very wrong with what was appeared a very well-intentioned, quite imaginative uh, policy. Oh, absolutely. And then just to, to bring us down to our, to our final point before we wrap, then in sort of a brief summation, how, how do you see wisdom as complementing imagination? Well, in, in the, the work I've done on wisdom, in some ways, um, explores this kind of loop that uh, there is a wisdom, uh, as in, in every tradition, which is about integrating ethics and bigger views into your decisions and understanding context. But a lot of wisdom is this ability, I think, in almost different domains to revise your view, <laughs> you know, to, to have an assumption that this is what may happen in, if I do this in my personal relationship or in health or in my town, and then being willing to see what actually happens and then revise and learn in the light of it. And that wisdom doesn't necessarily transfer so easily across different domains. You can be very wise in personal relationships, but not remotely wise on don't know, investing in the stock market. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a habit of mind of constantly looping and learning and challenging yourself is for me, the essence of wisdom, um, rather than perhaps what wisdom might've been in the past, which was just about, uh, uh, um, I'm mean, slightly caricaturing, but it's sort of elderly men with long beards speaking rather opaque 
ways about the world. That is a certain type of wisdom, performative wisdom, but it's actually not the very useful wisdom for actually living our lives. Mm, thanks so much. And yeah, it can be very apparent how that self-critical reflection is going to be a vital complement to, to imagination to stop us getting carried off in, into the lands of fantasy, perhaps. Um, well, I think we, we can wrap up there and say, Jeff, thanks so, so much for coming on. It's been a fascinating, fascinating conversation. The book was, was excellent and would really, really recommend all of those listening to read it once again called another world is possible um imparting is there anything you'd like to to share about what to to keep up with um from yourself or anything to look out for on the horizon your own work and how you're going to take this forward well just to thank you for this conversation theo and i mean my hope is we can dive into some specific fields and and apply some of these ideas and i'm really keen to hear feedback of where I'm wrong, you know, where I should be revising my, my models to do better in the spirit of what we were just saying. You know, the best reader is one who points out, you know, where you're you're wrong as well as where you might be right. Great. Well, hopefully you'll you'll get some great feedback off the back of this conversation then, Jeff. And thanks once again and thanks all for listening. Goodbye. Thank you.